and oh, sorry. And then um, what do those measures specifically look like? And then what are the um, most persistent barriers? to DEI. So what are the what are the problems and, and what are the solutions? And I would also even think about, you know, what, what are the aspirations? So if we had pie in the sky, what would that look like? How would we um, solve the problems um, and identify those barriers? And so the discussion today is really going to be about academics and the pipeline into the field. Um, we have four panelists with us here today. And I'm going to introduce them now and also give them some time to talk about their program uh, as we move forward. And then after that, we'll have uh, we'll open it up to have Q&A from the audience. Um, so first, let's see. We're going to start with um, Jennifer Barker and Michael Agee, both from um, Memphis in the Department of Ag Agriculture at the University of Tennessee. Um, first, let's introduce Jennifer. She's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Agriculture. She, I'm sorry, in the Department of Architecture. She received a professional Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, in 2005, she's also received her uh, post-professional Master's of Architecture from the University of Memphis and a Doctor of Education in Higher Education and Adult Education, also from the University of Memphis. Uh, in her research, she explores the curricular structure of architectural education and seeks to understand the critical, reflective, and narrative role of social implications of design. Um, her counterpart, Michael Eggy, is a professor and chair of the department, and he holds two professional degrees, a master's in architecture from Virginia Tech and a master's of city and regional planning from the University of Memphis. Uh, much of his work in architecture, uh, urban design, city planning has focused on quality of life issues um, for disenfranchised populations and giving back to the community. Uh, I believe that is one of his uh, core values as well as the Department of Architecture. And I'm sorry, I think I misspoke before, but they are both representing the University of Memphis. Let's see. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer and Michael to really talk through those questions that I outlined before and also talk specifically about what their department is doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, we believe very strongly in the Department of Architecture in the principles that we were talking about yesterday as well as what we're going to talk about today. And I wanna go through a few things and then Jennifer will go through as well. Some of the things that, that we're doing and um, some of the outcomes from, from those particular things. So the University of Memphis obviously is located in a, a very urban setting and uh, we are an urban serving university. And uh, as a result of that, we have a very strong focus to be engaged in the community and uh, Put, of our, put our studio projects into um, a lot of public service and, and community engagement activities. Um, all of us on the faculty are very much committed to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's in our studio culture policy, um, as well as a core value of the department. So some of the other things that uh, I think have been very helpful to us, um, we have a memorandum of understanding between the department in our local AIA component, AI Memphis, and our local uh, chapter of NOMA, as well as our, our AIS student chapter. And in that, we have uh, recruiting activities, retention activities, um, opportunities for internships with the students, opportunities to participate in AIA and, and NOMA activities, networking, and so forth and so on. The uh, composition right now of our, of our student body is about 50% white and 50% non-white, and a little bit more, maybe about 55% women. Um, and um, that's the undergraduate program, the graduate program is, is similar to that. 
uh, with a lot more international students. Uh, we do have international students at the undergraduate level. Um, so let me let me turn it over to uh, Jennifer at this point, and uh, then we'll come back sort of as a, a dual dialogue here. A lot of our support for diversity, equity, and inclusion comes from university and college support. So as a department, we're cited in the College of Communication and Fine Arts within the University of Memphis. And the university recruits heavily within our diverse population. So we are, are part of that system from a university scale. And then within the college, um, with we have communication, uh, journalism, and then art, music. We have a, a, a theater and dance with a pretty diverse college that we're a part of. And that helps, I think, attract as part of a larger system from university to college to department. And our college, our dean, is very focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion and has um, put in structures that help support that, including a committee of which one of our faculty members is a co-chair. But that committee and the dean's um, uh, drive is to make sure that the exposure to important material that helps faculty and therefore helps students understand what we're going, uh, what we have to address in relationship to diversity, equity, and inclusion is really important. Um, and so we've had over the past two to three years, um, meetings at our faculty meetings and as part of our committee to make sure that we're being educated and that we use that education to critique our own disciplines and then what that means for how we uh, teach every day and build out our curriculum. And so we've critiqued our curriculum um, extensively over the last decade and certainly over the last three to five years to think about how we can employ aspects of um, what we recognize and what our chair as a founding member of our department has recognized for, for decades um, so that we can do that. And the biggest part of how we do that is through community engagement projects by being engaged in the community with clients um, that have different voices and that share those different voices um, as a project driven directed. So we're hearing those voices and students are responding in service oriented aspects towards those voices. And that's happening at all of our levels, undergraduate and graduate. And to foster that specifically, we built in a, um, a one week uh, charrette project with a community engagement um, perspective to it, so that our students will understand what we meant by community engagement from the very outset happens in their, one of their first courses in our program and to teach them the aspects of community service that we wanted to promote from then forward in the second, third, fourth, and graduate programs. We also looked at um, our projects and how representative our projects were. And we did this uh, starting most extensively in our first year. That's where our, our biggest amount of diversity comes in because that's our biggest class. And as we looked at retention, we wanted to make sure that what we presented in our, in our um, projects was diverse, who could be studied, what projects were studied, how they were studied. And so going along with the community engagement project at that, that first year level, we also looked at the projects and the representation of those projects at the first year level. We also looked at our critique processes. Um, so we, there's a lot of literature out there about the way that the studio culture and the presentation of studio talk and critique can shift and change to be more co-learning focused. We looked at that and as a process of, again, our first year implementation to carry forward at our other levels, we um, investigated how the critique be could become uh, more discussion-based, so more one-on-one -on -one even potential. So we do and have done exhibit-based critiques so that our panel and jury actually moves from student to student, sometimes individually, sometimes within a group, and that students, peers, including um, upper years and graduate students are also part of those critiques. And we had to focus on alumni jurors as well, and diversity of jurors um, as we went through that process. We also investigated how we could set up our studios so that they could, um, students' voices could be part of that. They could decide on the organization of the studio how it could be made to foster creative, innovative thinking. 
and how the students could consider the ways in which they might be evaluated. So we involved um, peer critiques as part of our evaluation and we did more group work. And that's how we thought about making sure that student voices were a part of that. We still struggle um, with diversity in our faculty. We struggle with um, the limitations of some of our students because of the background from where they're coming from, which is uh, hugely economic in terms of financial concerns and the financial concerns of our um, interim students in terms of supplies and materials, one of the biggest costs that students talk to us about. And so we, um, our student organizations worked heavily to support our incoming undergrads. So there has been a focus in terms of first year in terms of retention. So those are a number of things that we've been trying to do to address uh, our approach and our critique to what we're doing here. And uh, Jennifer mentioned on um, recruitment of faculty, that's, that's been one of the areas that we would like to be able to improve. We, for the um, past probably decade or so, uh, we've been about 50-50 male-female in terms of our full-time faculty. And um, you know, a pretty good number of our adjunct faculty members uh, are, are female as well. But we do have uh, difficulty in, in recruiting people of color. We have one African-American um, uh, adjunct faculty member who's been with us for many, many years. Um, and we have made efforts when we've advertised for positions to um, recruit people of color, and, and we just have not been successful in doing so. And um, so that's one of the areas that we in particular would like to be able to improve upon um, as we move forward with any new positions that may become available. Um, like I mentioned, we, with our adjuncts, we, we do have uh, you know, a reasonably nice level of diversity there, but that could, that could improve also. One of the, the benefits I think with adjuncts and particularly as Jennifer had mentioned with uh, getting people to serve on design review juries and so forth is that we do have um, an absolutely fabulous relationship with AI in Memphis and um, a huge level of support from not only from the component, but also from uh, local architects. And so it's not difficult at all for us to be able to bring people in. And uh, we also have a, a nice opportunity available to our students to go tour the different firms and um, meet people that way. And so um, by doing so, I think that uh, they are starting to see the students that is are starting to see a level of diversity within the local firms. But again, as we all know, in, in the profession, we need to um, expand our opportunities in that area. So that's, that's a general overview. Um, I mean, certainly at the point where we are responding to questions, we can go into very much more detail or specifics if anybody wants to know more about it. Um, But one thing in, in, in my closing part, I, I would like to see um, a greater level of, of funding opportunities available for um, students who are interested in architecture. And I know we, we have several scholarships available and so forth and so on, but, but I think nationally, uh, there are also opportunities and I think a better effort to publicize those might be beneficial, particularly to uh, our students who are very challenged economically, uh, as Jennifer had noted. Thank you so much, um, Michael and Jennifer, uh, especially for the transparency around your barriers and um, with, with diverse faculty. I think that's a very important topic that hopefully um, we can delve in a little bit more when we have um, questions from um, the audience. Um, if you have questions specifically uh, for a panelist, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat, but we will also have some time at the end for people to come off mute and um, join a, dis a larger discussion. Um, next, we are going to move forward to um, Belmont um, with uh, Jennifer Amundsen, um, PhD. Um, Jennifer is the uh, inaugural Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at Belmont University. 
Um, prior to joining Belmont, uh, she served as the Associate Provost um, of Faculty, Dean of School of Art, Design and Architecture, and Professor of Architecture at Judson University in Elgin, Illinois. Um, Dr. Edmondson, um, Dr. Amundsen completed her doctoral studies at the University of Delaware after receiving um, her master's and her BS at the U University of Illinois. Um, she, as a former architect, studies um, architectural history with a particular interest in 19th century design, um, style, theory, and technology, uh, the history of the profession of architecture and the ed education of architects, um, supported by grants and fellowships from such institutions as the National Endowment for Humanities, the Smithsonian Institute, um, U.S. Capitol Historical Society, uh, Athenium of Philadelphia, the Grand Foundation, and Winterthorpe Museum, she is published extensively, especially in connection with the topic of her dissertation and first book publication, um, Thomas U. Walter, a founder of AIA. Her most recent research focuses on architectural and social histories of maternal hospitals in the United States, and her broader interests include the science of learning, distance education and digital humanities. Uh, in addition to her general responsibilities as Dean, Dr. Amundsen has developed the curriculum for Belmont's new programs in architecture. Um, her teaching responsibilities as a professor of architecture will include coursework in the history and theory of architecture. Uh, in the Nashville community, she also serves as member of the Metro Historical Commission. So um, we are excited to have you here and um, she has a presentation that she will share. Um, Dr. Amundsen, you can you can move forward. Mute. Okay. All right. Is my slide up? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for the, the invitation to take part uh, in this really important uh, conversation and presentation through the week. Um, you know, our program is uh, certainly distinct uh, among our, my, my colleagues here. I'll also be speaking in terms of it being small and relatively new. And so perhaps to make up for that, I'm taking a very big span and consideration of, um, of the topic as, as it's been posed. And again, just so thankful to be here to share ideas and, and learn from the collected audience here. So just as a, a, an overview for those of you um, who are unfamiliar with the new program at Belmont, this was announced in 2019 by our outgoing president, Bob Fisher. Uh, that's when the new dean program director, me, was, uh, was appointed. Uh, we have BARC and BSAS uh, programs housed in the Omar College of Architecture and Design in our home at Hitch Hall there on the right. Uh, in 2020, just last year, we uh, welcomed our first class and now we have two uh, cohorts um, uh, for an enrollment of about 55 students. And we're in the NAAB conduit now and expecting our accreditation um, in 2025. So that is the, uh, that's where we are right now, again, as we we're just getting started out. And you know, when I was asked to consider how recent events, um, monumental events have affected the program, uh, again, this, the program is being developed in, uh, in this incredibly difficult, challenging, but hopefully ultimately inspiring kind of environment. Um, and so this has been my own, you know, welcome to Nashville. I moved from the Chicago area and within you know four or five months we were shut down because of covid and the race issues coming along and you know uh, tornadoes floods terrorist attacks you know so it's been it's been a, an experience here in nashville so far um but it's that kind of this intense experience i know we've all been part of has certainly helped to focus our considerations as we've been working on uh, the new program so um, in terms of university response to the um, racial uh, issues that have become more and more to the forefront and long overdue, um, there has been a, a, a lot of kind of administrative things that you'd expect a university to do and are, are I'm sure not unique here to Belmont in terms of, you know, faculty having reading circles 
circles, the president and other administrations doing listening circles, et cetera. And you can uh, kind of you know read down that list uh, to get a se- get a sense of the kinds of things that Belmont added to the programs that were already in place to encourage diversity and inclusion on campus, recognizing that has been a historic issue here at Belmont. Um, perhaps the the two most important uh, things that have happened have occurred that were acted on um, a memorial, and this was the work of the faculty senate uh, to to recognize the relationship between the land on which Belmont sits to the practices of slavery, white supremacy, and racism. And so that was certainly an important, not just a good, um, a significant visual reminder that uh, see on campus, um, but again, sort of cracked open opportunities for important discussions to take place about really coming to terms with the legacy of the lands that uh, the university occupies, which you know was, I mean, you know, at the, the the top of the campus is the the mansion house that uh, was built by um, money accrued from from slave trade. And then the other, perhaps um, equally important, and maybe more significant long term impact, uh, one that's more meaningful to our educational objective, is the fact that uh, diversity impact statements are now required for all uh, courses in the university. So so as new programs are being developed and changed, there's a requirement now that goes through administrative channels that assures that um, faculty are responding to these issues within their curriculum and the resources that students are using. In terms of our own program, again, the program was very new at the time. So here I'm really thinking about what the college did as a whole. Um, we included a, a new emphasis on a speaker series focused on, on DEI, and you see uh, two of our speakers um, prominent for, for this audience is Juan Moreno from Chicago. Um, faculty recruitment has already been brought up um, from the folks from Memphis. Uh, that's a continued concern and interest. That's something that we can talk about. Probably that's, that's kind of in common with um, what firms are going through as well. Uh, two of the things that I, that I've instituted for the searches that we're doing right now uh, is to um, encourage the search committees to ignore the schools where people got their degrees, because uh, sometimes that is can be a kind of mesmerizing thing, an elite institution, but that's more about access and, and social positioning than the smarts and skills that uh, talents that people can bring to the campus. Um, and then also we um, require that underrepresented groups are brought to campus for the, the final round of, of interviews. Um, we're building on the programs that Belmont already has in place in terms of encouraging student recruitment um, through summer programs that are going to be uh, scholarship based so we can help bring people to campus and suggest that indeed design can be a career for everyone and across our, our disciplines, because that's you know part of the, the pipeline issue. And then in terms of our strategic plan, that, that is um, part of the advent of our new president, uh, Greg Jones, um, you see number one um, on this list, and, and all of them include issues of diversity and inclusion, but number one is really focusing on everywhere that diversity, equity, and inclusion can be included throughout our curriculum and practices. And you see we've we've added the B for belonging, which is something that our kind of the, the umbrella group on campus is concerned with too. So um, really focusing on making sure that once you have focused on diversity, provided equity, brought people in an inclusive way that you, you continue to look to make sure that they, they have a sense of belonging and they, they feel like they should be in this place. Um, also, again, in terms of the educational objective, what matters a lot um, and I think is, is foundational to the way we are um, making our programs more, more relevant and more um, liberational uh, are some of the, the kinds of comments and statements that you, you find in our, our culture policies statements in our, our student manual. And you see there on the right two of the paragraphs that I've pulled from this uh, relatively new document for the college, you know, which has only existed for a few years before architecture was founded here. And it's about um, increasing representation um, and, and recognizing that there are populations that have been historically excluded from higher education, generally speaking, and the design professions, more specifically speaking. Um, and then in the second paragraph, we talk about how representation and inclusion uh, needs to cut across all sectors, all aspects of what we're doing. Um, and uh, 
in in part, you know, taking part in making the world a better place, but also recognizing, again, specifically for what we're educating our students to do, that designers are better when they are more empathetic. So um, this, this, again, gets to a bigger curricular issue. And one of the um, uh, sort of inspirational quotes that I keep near me at all times, I have this printed out and stuck in a number of books and my planner and, and posted in my office in the corner too, um, and you know this uh, this scholar from Stanford, Jonathan Rosa, is he's not exactly saying anything brand new, but it's the way he sort of codified and brought this idea in a really clean, clear statement that I thought was really helpful. So that efforts to diversify syllabuses are less interesting than those to interrogate the fundamental intellectual limitations of fields whose canons have remained nearly exclusively white for generations. And I think this gets into part of the. Uh, Kind of the ideas that um, Ingrid uh, included in her uh, presentation yesterday that was was so great looking at again a big the bigger perspective and looking at root causes um, rather than just treating kind of the evidence of what grows from them because that's sort of the the, the sour fruit um, but really looking into the roots of what we have embedded into our practices both in education as well as the profession um, and later in the, the thread he he this he gets more specific uh, to say you know what questions has or hasn't your discipline been asking with what implications etc so i think this is you know this is advice this is a kind of um you know a very helpful you know poke um for uh, education as well as the, the profession so we have been about again trying to get this into our curriculum so i just have one case study here but i think it's, a, it's an important one because this is the um our 1015 is the course that all incoming uh, students take all the freshmen as well as new transfer students and so the course has been designed to introduce these broader ideas about education, about the profession to our students, and also make sure that they're hearing from diverse voices. So the very first person, the first assignment they have is to listen to Chimamanda uh, Adichie and this great TED talk she gave about having more than one story. So it's already introducing the idea that there's lots of different people to learn from, lots of different experiences to understand stand in architecture, and also then ideally um, empowering students to bring their own stories, their own backgrounds, their own traditions uh, into their education. Likewise, sustainability, which of course is not a new sexy thing to talk about anymore. It's what we all take for granted. We need to talk about sustainability and, and recognize it's important in the field, um, but rather than focusing on sort of the technical responses in architectural design that make a building sustainable or not, uh, we're looking at these more humanistic um, fundamentals uh, in this introductory co course, uh, recognizing these domains of environments, um, the, the economy and social structures as well. And that leads to an elevation of vernacular practices and recognizing that traditions of uh, people groups who have been excluded um, for broader reasons of histories that have been racist at heart going back centuries, um, bringing those into the conversation about architecture, perhaps for the first time, um, at least for the recent last recent decades. Um, likewise, that course also includes um, very specific commentary um, on the local scene. Um, there's a great resource in the bottom there from the state library system about that's uh, mapping the destruction of Tennessee's African American neighborhoods. Uh, the students here, Whitney Young's. Um, sort of a searing critique of the AIA from 1968. And then I think, you know, required viewing for, for all of us uh, is that um, short film um, at the top, um, segregated by design. So again, these are introductory ideas that are, are brought in with the hopes that we're, we're inculcating our students with a broader idea of what architecture is, also the problems that it has faced uh, with, of course, the great hope that this next generation is going to do better than mine in fixing these problems. So what remains to be done? Well, the NAAB has these new conditions for accreditation, which many of you may be uh, familiar with um, or not. But if you don't know, I will just highlight the fact that they are looking at um, promoting more flexibility uh, so that uh, curricula can adapt to a dynamic context. They want to encourage 
distinctiveness among programs, support DEI, and increase access to the profession. So you see our accrediting body has been um, focused on these issues and making sure they're part of the accreditation process as well. Um, of course, it remains to be seen if, if that has teeth and if they're going to follow through. You know, my hope is very much that they, they indeed will. Um, what also remains to be done, you know, I think there, there's a lot of other groups that have been um, popping up in recent years. I just bring in two that I've been following um, for a few years. Um, again, I find their work really inspirational, uh, even though it, it does uh, lean uh, radical for some people's uh, tastes. Design is protest on the left, founded around 2017 to advocate for justice in the built environment primarily and then on the right the architecture lobby which is set up as an advocate for um, architecture workers um, so two great resources there and as i come to the the end of my my remarks here um, thinking about barriers you know i think that everyone i know when they come to an understanding and a recognition um, oftentimes of the privilege they've had uh, that's helped them get to the place where they are in education um, or the profession they become inspired to want to help of course barriers are they need the direction they need the time to revise things because none of us have bonus extra time um, as much as we would like to that needs to be kind of baked into our structures as well and what can go along with that is a reward system you know in the educational context that means um, promotion and tenure has to recognize the importance of this work as well um, and uh, simplistic thinking and lack of historical awareness kind of go together um, there is a pipeline and, and and you know the math works that the bigger the end of the pipeline the more people who come in but it doesn't change the fact that they're going to you know bleak and bleed out across time um, especially when this is the end point of that pipeline um, and here in terms of historical awareness i think it's something we all need to come to terms with that the and this is a photo of the the, the aia in 1883 um, you know the, the aia was founded to exclude people from practice uh, that's in in the broader history of professionalization that's why doctors and lawyers and architects and a whole bunch of people developed education and licensure laws and examinations to uh to exclude people from practice who they thought were you know unworthy so when we're given that you know, I think, you know, always it's never a bad thing to end a talk like this with uh, Audre Lorde. And, you know, I, I, I take to heart the fact that I'm I'm pulling her words out of context. This was an essay or at least a statement, an essay about the limitations of white feminism. But I think it's apropos here. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I think it's very difficult to imagine that the tools, the practices that we have established in the practice, as well as education, without interrogating them, without pulling them apart, uh, we're not going to see the change that we want. And I know certainly everyone who has joined this call and taken time out of their day, um, and it's not just this day, this represents time that you're spending elsewhere too. Um, I think, again, to find the practices and tools, we need to look farther than the structures that we've put in place already. So thanks very much, and I look forward to the later conversation. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and again, if you have any questions that are specific to Belmont, please put them in the chat, uh, and we will definitely uh, try to include that in our larger discussion as well. Um, we have uh, one more panelist, and we will now move to uh, Jason Young. Uh, he is the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, he began his tenure as Dean uh, in July 2021 after serving as professor and director of the college's School of Architecture for seven years. Over his 25 plus year academic career, he has taught architecture at the University of Tennessee, the University of Michigan, and as the 2013 Howard Friedman Visiting Associate Professor of Practice at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, his academic research uh, explores contemporary conditions of American urbanism in post-city, um, oh, I'm sorry, in um, post-academic uh, research, uh, excuse me, tongue-tied today, um, but yeah, he explores contemporary conditions of uh, 
American Urbanism in Post-City Digital Organized Culture. Um, Young was the 2012-2013 Helmut Stern Professor uh, in the University of Michigan Institute of the Humanities. Um, he has lectured on urbanism research uh, at the Berlage Institute in the Netherlands, the ETH uh, Zurich, and the uh, Patonico di Torino in the University of Venezuela. Um, the Rhode Island School of Design and the University of California at Berkeley, among others. Uh, he holds a master's in architecture from Rice University and is uh, a bachelor of science in architecture from Georgia uh, Institute of Technology. And so I'm going to give it over to Jason Young to give our final um, panel this discussion and then we'll move into our group discussion. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you, Ingrid, for the introduction. And uh, thank, thanks to my panelists. This is a great to, to, to be together uh, in conversation. And um, to, to the AIA Tennessee, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this conversation. So I have a, um, a, a couple of different um, sets of thoughts here that I wanted to share for the conversation. I mean, it'll echo in some regards some things that my colleagues have said. Um, and, 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 and hopefully we'll add to, to the conversation that we have afterwards. So just to first to note um, for me personally and professionally, um, in, 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 my, in my career as, a, as an educator, I've, I've seen education as something that's fundamentally defined by encountering difference. So I think that the, the best learning often happens when we're um, confronting things that, we de that, that are unfamiliar to us that force us to rethink the position that we've previously taken to question our own assumptions. And therefore I see diversity as fundamental to education. I mean, it's just part of how I've developed um, my own sense of teaching is that diversity is essential to education and to higher education. I believe it's, it's absolutely essential. And I think when you add design education into the the, the mix, and, and all of us are, are interested in thinking about design education, everyone on this panel, and the implications that it has for the future of design. I think the role diversity plays gets even more important because design, as we know, is not about right and wrong answers or responses. It's about the gray area. It's about the complex middle ground between extremes. And we don't, we don't generally see design through um, simplistic lenses. Um, rather, we see we see design, you know, as a, as a diverse activity. Designers are often the ones who um, distinguish themselves from one another by their ability to think about things um, that that other people don't see or don't think about. And so, I believe that that therefore, design education calls on the need for diversity even more more stridently. And I think the events of the spring of 2020 were. Um, offer really a rupture point for many of the things that were happening in the discipline of architecture specifically. But I think we can broaden that out to um, design education. And so it's really incumbent upon all of us and certainly in panels like this to, to take up what is the fallout of a rupture point like that? What are the gaping failures and lapses? And what are the, what are the attempts that were ongoing before those events that need to really be shored up and rallied? And how do we expand the palette um, and expand the tools that we have for thinking about these issues. So it's exciting to, to be here. Efforts at um, University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design. Both our college and university have been, uh, have been in, implicitly committed to issues of diversity, I think, for many years, but it's definitely becoming more of a strong discourse in almost everything we do. So like was mentioned in, in other talks, the university has set up a vice chancellor, diversity engagement, that's an office that is now um, formalized within the, the office of the chancellor um, as a way to keep these conversations actionable and meaningful. Um, there are essentially five areas that I would like to share that are very, I think, have varying um, degrees of difference even within them that we're doing within our college. So first of all, accelerating the work that we were already doing with community partners and looking for even more robust relationships with community partners. So we have examples of faculty members in our college who've been working with um, things like the Odd Fellows Cemetery in, Knox, in East Knoxville, a um, 
a, a, a cemetery that is um, through design being made more visible both in the community that it represents, but also in the larger understanding of the city. The Appalachia Studio uh, in the college has for years worked with impoverished communities in Appalachia have worked in uh, along with um, other um, uh, city organizations, community organiz organizations and cities. And that, you know, we had, we're recommitting to that um, um, even stronger than ever before uh, these days. Beersley Farm and other design build projects. So Beersley Farm is a community farm in the Mechanicsville neighborhood of Knoxville, where our students designed and built with um, this community farm, a 1200 square foot education facility that offers restrooms and office space, but importantly, interior and exterior teaching rooms for basically a community farm group in a, in a neighborhood that's a food desert. Um, the other Knoxville engagement, such as our engagement with the Burlington neighborhood um, in partnership with the East Tennessee Community Design Center, the engagement in Chattanooga. One example is a recent studio that engaged the Bessie Smith Cultural Center and African American Museum um, via our relationship with the Chattanooga Design Studio there who are brokering introductions to us in different um, communities there in Chattanooga. Um, looking at housing issues in Knoxville. So we have a number of faculty who have been running pretty complex studios that are engaging um, the city of Knoxville, engaging communities in Knoxville around questions of equitable housing. And of course, our involvement in Nashville um, in partnership with the Civic Design Center, um, which is foundational to, to what we do here at the school is important. The River Line, which is a larger, almost economic development type project that's emanating out of um, our college in collaboration with the Herbert College of Agriculture, specifically the School of Landscape Architecture, offers the opportunity for all sorts of community engagement along the river um, in an ambitious idea about having a kind of trail and waterway um, system that touches um, three states and a large, part of the, a large part of the state of Tennessee. We've established an ACE program in Knoxville um, there are strong ACE programs already in Memphis and in, in Nashville, but there wasn't one in Knoxville. So we, um, our college took the lead on that and are partnering with local high schools to ignite the passion for architecture and design. And then our graphic design, because we are four schools here, School of Design, School of Interior Architecture, School of Landscape Architecture, and a School of Architecture. Um, our graphic design students work in a program called DUNK which is an after-school design club at Vine uh, Middle Magnet School here in, in, in Knoxville and off, offer a chance for us to, again, introduce um, young and, and increasingly younger people into what it might be to go into a career of design. The adoption at the university level of an explicit commitment to diversity action plan. So every college on campus, um, including ours, has now um, instituted and rolled out a diversity action plan covering areas, including climate, recruiting and retaining, um, developing partnerships with diverse communities, as I was speaking about in curricular perspectives. In, in uh, uh, corresponding to that is every college on campus now has a director of diversity, uh, a director of diversity relations. Um, our college has an explicit DEI committee, which is comprised of faculty, students, and staff. And um, these formal mechanisms help us maintain diligence and focus. And as someone said here, baking that into the very institutional fabric of what we're doing to hold ourselves accountable um, to, to, to our commitments to these things. Um, I like to think about cultural competency as something that we're, um, that, that as a way of talking about DEI initiatives. And I think that it's important that one make one's own culture um, part of the inspection that's happening on campuses and in these educational programs. So um, making resources available for mental wellness. We also have a studio culture policy, as was mentioned, that mandates more healthy ways of going about design education that we've seen in our history. Um, and really working on the, uh, the, the idea of our own culture as something that would you know, that would underpin an idea about cultural competency, an understanding of ourselves in relationship to others and an understanding of others in relationship to others. Recruiting and admissions. Um, we have a summer design camp that we've had for years that we make um, scholarships available to lower the, the barrier for that entry. That generally attracts high school students um, from all over the state. And when it went digital during COVID times, 
it was quite a national um, draw on that, which we are very proud of. Implementation of holistic admissions process. So we're trying to get beyond the numbers on admissions and think more about um, engaging the full um, holistic uh, application there. Um, engaging enrollment management protocols with an interest in making all of our students' uh, experiences more diverse and existing and new scholarship efforts. So um, one example is a new Keystone scholarship that we're working with with Hastings in Nashville that is an explicit attempt to lower the financial barriers to our field. And then finally, decolonizing the curriculum. And, and, and Dean Amundsen spoke really beautifully about this. Um, to me, this is about everything from getting more clear with students about when we're speaking through the work of Eurocentrism of white male histories of architecture and design, just simply calling that out. I know as a student, like that was never explicitly called out for me. Um, you, you pick up on it if you stay around the academy long enough. But I think as a young person in the field, just simply having that called out is a way of breaking down um, some of the background assumptions, making syllabi more diverse explicitly um, by including uh, non-Western, non-Eurocentric, non-white male aspects to every class and really engaging students where they are. So really thinking about, you know, how students are seeing the material, how they may, you know, want to reorganize the way that the material is, um, is, is reinforced in their education. I feel like quickly here to end in the future, you know, obviously there's more to do. Uh, there's more work to do. We don't claim in any sense um, that, that we're doing enough. I think the, the, the impetus here is to try to do more and find ways to be impactful. Um, in higher education, you know, this, this issue of diversity, equity, inclusion will require attention to all areas, you know, and, and simultaneously. So I totally support the notion of getting beyond simplistic thinking in here. This is a complex, multi layered issue that I think has to be approached. We want to support student organizations and empower them more in the future. We want to continue to scrutinize and enrich our curriculum, continue to make progress on our diversity action plan. Um, seek more partnerships with more diverse communities and organizations. Again, we have a strong history of that, but how to build on that. Um, develop financial resources for diverse students that help lower the barrier. I'll give you a quick example. Our architecture department requires off-campus study that can have the effect of producing financial barriers to, to students who come from certain economic backgrounds. And we want as an institution to try to break down those barriers. Um, reaching, increasingly reaching out to underrepresented students in high school and middle school, and not so much as a pipeline notion, but uh, to advocate for good design, to advocate for architecture, to advocate for going into these professions. I think little is understood at a grassroots level about what a life in architecture might mean and how to, how to sort of storm in on that. So targeting high school and middle school students simply as an educational process. And I think that um, just in closing, you know, that diverse, more diversity in architecture education will build more diversity in, um, in the profession. Um, it's, it's a long haul, I believe. There's no silver bullet to these issues. Um, diversity is at the center of robust architecture and design education, as I tried to say at the start of my comments. And I think it leads to broad thinking and empathetic as was mentioned before, professionals who improve community. So the more that we can get students engaged with community groups to hear diverse takes on their aspirations for the future of their um, built environment, I think the more that we can um, lace diversity in in multiple ways. So um, with that, I'll, 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 um, I'll stop there. And just again, to say thank you very much for everyone taking time to, uh, to, to engage in this conversation. Um, and, and thanks for the organizers and Ingrid, thank you. Yes, thank you so much to, to all the panelists for participating today. And again, being transparent and, and um, talking through barriers as well as successes in their programs. Um, I have one question that for each of you and then um, we will go into um, audience discussion. This, this question is kind of just coming from listening to everyone's presentation. So it is off the cuff, so I apologize. Um, one thing that I think that came up for me listening to um, each panelist is something that I think resonates in all um, industries in my consulting work 
is that I feel as though things are light on equity. And so I wanted to ask specifically, um, each of you can answer, of course, but uh, you don't have to, um, because I know you're not prepared for this question. Um, but what was what does equity look like in, in your program? Is it being done um, or not? And um, what do you think are the barriers to equity specifically? And for um, those who didn't um, participate in our discussion yesterday, um, equity is really about um, how do we right past wrongs in our work, which would mean that we are giving more um, to underserved populations. And that can look like a variety of things. And I'm wondering what does equity look like at your uh, universities and your programs? Or is it not being addressed yet? I can, I can suggest something. Um, my focus is on curriculum. It's, it's heavily focused on curriculum. And I think when I consider equity, the first thing I think about is um, a term from education, which is meeting the student where they are. And so the evaluation of um, skill level development per student is looking at where they came in when they entered the class and looking at uh, an individualized understanding of their ability to grow and develop in relationship to where they're coming from. And thinking about that student, I, I had to think about that in relationship to what I'm trying to achieve within the curriculum, but thinking about that student's personal and individual growth and how they're able to develop in themselves apart from all the other students in the class. And so I, the approach in equity very directly related to curricular evaluation has to do with assessment of where that student is and the personal critique that happens between a faculty member and a student as you look to grow that student and grow yourself in relationship to that student along the way. So that's where um, I think we put a lot of energy in, in very directed curricular evaluation and structure. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, two things I would add to that, or maybe sort of two populations I would think about um, is uh, I've been trying to develop practices that counter a, a traditional idea that once you get into college, you all, and especially now as we're bringing people in from diverse experiences and backgrounds, treating them like they all have to have the same output. So recognizing that, you know, for students who went to um, really well-equipped high schools, they might have had access to art class uh, and others didn't. So it's one of the reasons we don't have a portfolio review um, for from admittance. Um, and but also, though, you know, some students come from a background where, say, writing has been valued in a way that others have not. So, you know, I teach architecture history. I do provide an option for people who are comfortable with writing, you know, long formal essays and research papers, that kind of thing. But then also think about how we can get to learning objectives, how we can accomplish those through different means. So and some students just like the, a creative, um, a, a different kind of creative outlet, say, do, doing what, what's commonly called an, an unessay and uh, ed circles, um, asking, uh, allowing them to do, you know, a short video or some other kind of, of sort of visually creative project to, again, accomplish goals without uh, mandating that they're held back potentially by not having the experience um, of, of other students and then and helping them along because, of course, by the time they get out, we hope that they have uh, competencies in, in writing that are going to serve them in, in the field, of course. And then the other thing to think about, um, again, the faculty who come in, and I try and be mindful of, uh, you know, just, you know, doling out dollars for professional development. Um, you know, some people come in here and they've been married. They come from stable backgrounds. Uh, they had, you know, great uh, funding in grad school. And so they were able to go to a bunch of conferences and publish things and participate in gallery shows. And then others who have, uh, you know, child care or, or parent care responsibilities or you know, different kinds of pathways into higher ed, 
may not be, you know, as far along in terms of how they're getting to you know, uh, put their tenure dossier together. Um, so I make the conscious effort to steer more resources, um, a time as much as I can. That's always the thing people want most, and I, it's hardest to provide, um, but definitely resources so they can make those accomplishments and, and make it to tenure and promotion. Just to add a few things, I, I, I appreciate that um, what, what others have said already. I think, I mean, you, Ingrid, you, you, you're putting a, a pretty, I think you're pretty, putting a pretty provocative framework around the question of equity, giving more to populations that have historically been underserved. And I think one of the, one of the built-in barriers for that is just mechanisms for getting the support to those groups, you know, so, um, you know, that a lot, a lot of the institutional uh, tracks of support that we have, you know, are that are themselves um, asking for a non prejudicial brokering of those. And so it can be a challenge. There's tension. So in our holistic review process, that's about trying to give every applicant a, re, a type of review that looks into their personal story, right? Not, not, not only representatives from certain groups and it's trying to get beyond the numeric bias that's that's in the process and it's you know and it's difficult because because of the the number of applications and the time intensity of that holistic review but i would see that as some you know part of an attempt to make you know to make the the the, the student body more equitable in that sense and i think there's a question in the chat about could i describe more what i meant by cultural competency and i think it bears on this question of equity as well and what 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 i'm referring to, to and using that term is the sense that the the sense that what an organization wants to be wants to have um, in, in in order to really move towards diversity equity inclusion and belonging i love i love the addition of the b there um, it is a sense that everyone's culture matters that so cultural competency to me is the understanding that that other others cultures are as sophisticated and nuanced as your own so that you approach others with a sense of competency at the cultural level that you don't just see things in terms of what's being reinforced in your own experience or what's missing in your own experience that you because you've interrogated your own sense of identity and your own sense of culture, you have the competency to engage in a cultural conversation that looks for um, looks for ways in which you can be impacted by by, by think, things you didn't already think about or think or, or, or types of backgrounds or experiences that other people are bringing into a conversation. Um, and, and, and I think I, to me, I see cultural competency and the idea that we would focus on culture as part of the conversation, not just take that for granted. Focus, and, and we often do that by focusing more on things like accreditation criteria and, 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 and other, other more institutional um, indicators that we have to, to meet in order to maintain you know, our, our status as, as, as producing professionals who are competent and ready for the workplace. How do you get culture in there, right? And I, I like the notion of meeting students where they are. I like the notion of, you know, that encouraging people at a, an amazing point in their lives where they, many of our students, and I think this is true of, of, of folks this age, are encountering more difference than they've encountered previously in their life, simply by moving from more familiar environments into an, a university or college environment where there are more people your age. And it's a campuses are known in amazing places because of the social and intellectual experimentation that happens within a group. It's not homogeneously the same age, but with this, you know, with those kinds of commitments being maybe the only thing that's holding everyone together. Thank you so much to all the panelists for their um, response along the lines of equity. At this point, we're going to open up the discussion um, to, um, to the larger group. I invite everyone to um, turn their cameras on if they can, and so that we can engage in a different way. Um, and I also invite you to either use your raise hand um, um, option, depending on, on your service, or you can definitely come off mute and join us. 
Um, but I know that we have a, at least a couple of people who have already put in questions in the chat. So I want to go to uh, Valerie Franklin first, and then we will move to the rest of the, of the questions that we have. Hello, Ingrid and everybody. I didn't know if you're going to read it or, or not. But um, great, great discussion today. Um, I, I have a couple of things. I have a statement and then a question. But before I even ask, make my statement, I want to ask, is it um, Mr. Young? Um, what your definition of cultural competency is? Yeah, as as I was just saying, I think that um, you know the the way that I, the way that I use that term is that that in order for the conversation to get to a nuanced level, I think people have to have interrogated their own cultural position, and that they have to believe or be encouraged to think that other, other people's construction of identity is just as complicated as their own. And therefore they have the competency to engage in a conversation about cultural difference. Okay, I think I, think I got the gist of that. So I, I'll go into the, the statement and um, it's, it's gonna come from, you know, a, a statement that Dr. Amundsen made um, about, the, uh, about the mansions at, at Belmont you know, being built, you know, with uh, money, you know, from slave trade and slave labor. Um, I, I, would, I would just challenge you all to understand or at least kind of, um, I guess, relate this to your students or maybe incorporate it into the program. So not only, you know, was, you know, the, the mansions built with the, the, the money from slave trade, they were also employed the, the slave labor you know, of the, you know, free, the free labor, you know, from slavery. Um, and those, those slaves, they employed techniques that they had learned uh, from Africa in order to, to build and construct different detailings and, and things in these structural, these things that we hold uh, so high in the United States, these buildings. Um, and they brought that from Africa to the United States. So then the focus goes on talent and skills of their ancestors. And to me, that plays into that idea of cultural competency. Um, not just saying that, okay, your ancestors were out there picking cotton, you know, in the fields, they were serving us, blah, blah, blah. But also play on the fact that they had talent and skills and they brought that to the architectural realm. So that's that's just a, that's just a statement that that I wanted to make, um, and then also this platform I think is probably the best one to bring up the conversation about Leslie Loco. Um, she she resigned as dean of the Spritzer School of Architecture at City College in New York City. I'm sure you all know that, um, citing a cri crippling workload and lack of empathy for Black women. And this is, this is to quote Leslie, the lack of respect and empathy for black people, especially black women, caught me off guard, although it's by no means unique to Spritzer. And then she continued to say, I suppose in the end that my resignation was a profound act of self-preservation. Um, for, for you all that don't know, uh, Leslie was the first uh, African-American woman to be de dean of a school of architecture. Um, and she, she resigned just based on uh, racial and 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 lack of lack of empathy for her and for black people that she saw. So um, I would say that you know her her example and her coming out and being so bold to say why it, it is that she really left you know the college. Uh, I think at, back to the students that 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 have left and haven't had the opportunity to have her platform and say why they left. Uh, a lot of times we think that students leave because they weren't talented enough. They didn't have enough money. They didn't have a good enough education. But a lot of times students and the stories that I've heard from students that look like me uh, in these colleges, um, they've said that they've, they've left or they've been subjected to lack of empathy, lack of understanding, lack of cultural understanding, cultural bullying. Um, and they, they've left those institutions because of that. So I, I would like to hear you know, from 
some of you or, you know, or one or two of you on how you are keeping students in the schools that, that you, you know, I hear the programs and everything that you have, but programs are only as good as people that, that attend the programs. You know, what are you doing to help the, um, to instill empathy to your student body in general um, so that these students don't feel the pressure of lack of empathy? And, and I think that's, that's my question. That's a big one, Valerie. <laughs> you always big, bring the big questions. Um, I think that there is a, a general need for, for more empathy and less grind in our field. Um, you know, and when I was in school in the 80s, and I bet a lot of you can, can uh, you know, feel this, that uh, rigor and dedication and passion was uh, proven by your ability to stay up two, three, four nights in a row. And that's how you prove that you were really into it and really dedicated. And that, of course, doesn't take into account, um, well, how a lot of students, a lot of people just, you know, recognize mental and physical health matters a lot. And then also those who have the extra, extra responsibilities at home. Um, and so I can, you know, anecdotally, I don't have statistics and I don't wanna to be too specific um, with my student group here. But, you know, I recognize that students of color are perhaps more likely to be living at home with families than they are in the dorms here at Belmont. And that creates special responsibilities. Some of them take care of uh, younger siblings. Um, COVID, of course, has run through uh, communities of, of color in our particular way here that has affected our students as well. So it has been a benefit to them and a benefit to everyone to recognize that we need to be gentler and more flexible in everything we do. Um, one more thing I would add is that um, I know there's there's a practice I that, that we, we all, I'm sure, try and avoid is to put the burden for being the representative and the voice for your group um, on a rare student or faculty member of color. Um, so, you know, students should never be called out for, why don't you provide us with, you know, the black experience and um, requiring them to be sort of, you know, a, a spokesperson and it creates a whole different kind of uh, emotional load on that student. And then likewise, I know that, you know, and I think we all recognize this across uh, campuses that um, uh, different service opportunities, especially ones that tend to be kind of in the, the touchy feely um, emotional range, advising, and especially now with a greater likelihood that students report uh, mental challenges uh, and emotional needs, um, those responsibilities tend to go to female faculty. And every committee wants at least, you know, a person of color. Ideally, there's more than, you know, just one to go around. So it is an extra burden um, for that community to be represented on every single committee um, when there's not enough to go around. And then also there's the, you know, the reward system when that is not going to be uh, as well regarded as, you know, the, the white faculty member who got to, you know, stay in his or her office and, and work on their, their monograph or their article or whatever. So there's a lot of expectations we place and sometimes it's, it's well intended, right? But I think that the, we need to be careful and listen to those communities about how much they want to be engaged and how much they want or don't want to have the responsibility of teaching us how to be people. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I would say, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I would say not enough. Not enough is being done. And that's changing now um, in, in, in ways that, you know, that, that, that I, that I see clearly, but not enough. I mean, we, 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 we here, here at UT, we offer services um, for students in terms of um, free tutoring. Um, that's available to all students, but the, but the hope is to take some of the technological uh, variances in terms of student preparation coming in and not allow that to define performance. Um, we try to listen more. Um, we try to empower our student groups more. 
um, give them meaningful budgets so that they can produce programming, um, support programming when it's brought forward. Um, we don't mandate that uh, that that our that our student groups do particular kind of programming, but when they're when the when the desire is there, we try to uh, shore that up with with financial wherewithal, which can lead to agency, right? So that they can impact something like a lecture or a college event. Um, st students and students of color can can impact the the shape of our lecture series, um, et cetera. But you know, but but again, frankly, I think not enough is done. Uh, I appreciate you raising that. Yeah, I, I agree. Also, not enough uh, has, has been done or being done. But um, I'll, I'll offer a, a couple examples going to the idea of, of the involvement of the student groups, particularly our chapter of the AIAS. Um, and, and one thing, by the way, Jennifer and I teach uh, first, both teach first semester, uh, first year courses. And in the reference to the all nighters uh, hits home, because one of the things that we stress to our students from day one is that all-nighters are not good for your mind or your body. And uh, we, we uh, again, that's, that's very important to us. But with the student organizations with AIS, uh, there's several things that I think they are doing that has been beneficial to, uh, to all the students. But, um, and that is the, uh, they have a peer mentor program and that brings together uh, all the students really in uh, a variety of different ways, social events, as well as professional development events. Um, and we, we also have uh, a the, in the studio culture policy where each studio, and again, we're a small program, but each design studio elects a representative to serve uh, on the AIS board. And that representative can speak on behalf of all the students. So if a student has an issue, whatever it might be, um, they prefer not to come to Jennifer or me about it. Uh, they can go to their studio rep and that studio rep can come to us uh, keeping that other student anonymous and, and talking through things. And I think that's helped some of the students who maybe were having a more difficult time fitting in for whatever reason to become more used to the way in which things are happening, become much more comfortable. And then the final thing through the AIS workshops, uh, the students are put on pretty much a, an equal basis there where um, the younger students are provided a lot of tips and tools and techniques and materials and so forth to help them, whether it's with diagramming or with model making or photography or resume building or whatever it might be. And I think that's proven to be quite beneficial uh, throughout all the level of the undergraduate as well as the graduate students. Thank you so much for your, um, your answers. Um, for Valerie, and we have two others that I want to get to. Um, first is Anna, and then I also see a question from Jason Campbell, and we'll come to him next. Um, Anna, feel free to come off mute and talk to the audience. All right, can you hear me? Wonderful. I First, let me apologize for not having my video up. Um, it has been disconnected, and that requires me climbing underneath my desk, which I was not willing to do during the middle of this. So. Um, and I also apologize because I'm going to be broaching the same topic that Valerie just did. Thank you so much, Valerie. My question was initially to Ingrid and I asked her, I said, or I said, I am enjoying these speakers, but I'm curious as to why a person of color is not speaking. It is wonderful to see what different institutions are doing to promote DEI, but I think a large part of the discussion should also be listening to the populations who are actually experiencing or have experienced these issues directly, whether it's race, gender, socioeconomic. Um, I would like to see more voices of a, of a more diverse population. Um, I am... I am happy to hear the steps that U of M and Belmont and UTK are taking, um, but a couple of additional questions would be, one, how did you arrive at what your list of issues is? Did you do surveys? Did um, a group of people who may or may not have a dog in the fight sit and come up with what they assumed that the issues are? Uh, and secondly, do you have time frames or benchmarks for reassessing the goals that you have set so far, um, whether it's 
changing up those goals mid plan or a final time from a you know time frame of we would like to have a b and c completed by 2023 and then my third question would be i guess just to aia tennessee because i'm a support member at an architectural firm not an actual aia member yet but i would like more information about becoming involved but that's secondary that is it those are my questions and statements yeah i'm i'm willing to jump in here i i mean in terms of i mean i think you're you know obviously you're raising a great issue like you know where 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 are the the bipoc creatives on this panel um they're they're not in administrative roles they're not deans um and that that that's that's work still to be done um but in terms of in terms of the your second you know and so i you know i i would encourage the tennessee aia to 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 think about broadening broadening a conversation like this that would include people other than let's say the administrators because i think it in some regards would um it, it would corroborate some of the things you're hearing uh, i would i think certainly some of the things i'm saying and then you would there would also be you know some differences there that could be could be quite interesting so it might be an interesting follow-up panel um you know, my issues around diversity, equity, inclusion are informed by a process other than just my own rumination on the topic. I mean, our um, director for diversity relations, um, who, uh, who, who, who works as a direct liaison between the faculty, the students and the staff, and myself, and also the university's um, vice chancellor for diversity and, and, and um, engagement you know, has been instrumental in, in the development and more the implementation based on when she arrived here. She arrived in January 2021, formally, um, Milagro Zingoni, who's also the director of the School of Interior Architecture. But before her arrival, the diversity action plan was um, produced by a committee of students, faculty, and staff, you know, who, who had a strong mandate. It was a, it was a very heavy lift. And that mandate was to hold listening sessions with different constituents in the college and develop an actionable plan with timelines and with benchmarks. And, um, and, and that, that work was completed in, um, in, in late 2020. I mean, COVID impacted that process dramatically. It was underway before the, the, the renowned um, pivot to, to online education that happened in March of 2020, but it was rolled out um, in the spring of 21, endorsed by all the faculties of all four schools, and is now part, part of how we're measuring one another's performance within the unit. Um, so there is, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a good thing, that there is, there is um, a, a systemic and multi-layered approach to these issues. It's not coming down to the benevolence or the enlightenment of a single administrator. It's a it's a core commitment in, in our case in, in the college that's shared by faculty and staff. And the students come and go through the systems that we have that are long, longer lasting than a, than a particular cohort. But their their voices are also reflected in the in the diversity action plan. So just some context to add to that to your issue you raised. Thank you. And just briefly, I will add that, um, um, and, and thanks, Jason. I think it sounds like you've got a, a really comprehensive way to go forward. Uh, what we, what I've done is to, um, whenever we're, we have a new initiative, uh, is to take a multi-layered approach to in, bring in as many voices as possible. So the faculty across the board, including the part-timers, because you know they have a perspective that's important as well. And always making at least one, usually the first, if not more, um, options to weigh in anonymous. So they say they're a, a Google survey or a Jamboard or something. So if people want to, if people feel tentative about bringing hard things to the fore, uh, criticisms of the administration or me, you know, that's fine. There's room to do that. And then in terms of our um, our strategic plan, we we followed the university's model, but this is a five year plan, and we we have to write reports on an annual basis um, and that can get in you know become a little bit static and, and stale so we will have a, a college discussion about it and and also to make this more more personal and hopefully supportive 
um, there will be an aspect of the sort of diversity initiatives and, and, and talking about them at each faculty member's annual review. And in part for me to check in, make sure, you know, holding them accountable to keep working on this thing, but also very importantly to say, what's hard? How do you need support? What can I do to help you make this happen? Yeah, we're fortunate in that we have a very small faculty, eight full-time people and between four to eight adjunct faculty members who are uh, involved in all the decision-making as well. And so most all of the decisions that we make internally in the department are made by the entire faculty. Uh, we have committees, but it's almost always a situation where everybody serves on those committees. So uh, we also involve students in faculty hiring uh, searches and so forth. So. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for um, for interaction. Thank you, panelists, for your response. Uh, I'm going to um, give Jason. I'm sorry, not Jason. Let's see, Aaron Campbell, um, the ability to ask his question, and then we'll move to you, Jared. Um, Aaron, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. I am at home under the weather, so my camera is also off. But um, the question I had was basically regarding to what type of training is typically given to the faculty uh, regarding DEI and really for the purpose of making sure, you know, that oftentimes there's a, there's a big turnover in architecture, specifically that first year for new students. And oftentimes, <clears throat> students of color who are part of that big turnover because a lot of them have not been um, you know a lot of them haven't been uh, privy to things related to architecture so this is a whole new world coming in so the question is what type of training is typically given at either, either of you all's facilities to kind of close that gap between you know students who might be coming in very new to this ultimately the goal is to improve our numbers you know improve that two percent number to be higher in uh, minority architects. So it starts with schooling and just trying to see what's, what's, and I think you guys have answered it. Maybe through all your responses individually have kind of answered that question. So if you've already answered it, you can just kind of recap it or, or we can move on. But that was my question. So our training comes from our uh, college, most recently, it's been on first generation students, implicit bias and mental health um, as a faculty requirements as part of our diversity, equity, inclusion. Those are the three most prominent ones I can think about. And then as an apartment situated in the college, our college has a student success advisor, which is a relatively new position for our college. And they're um, trained in relationship to all of the available resources on the campus that the college can take advantage of and the departments can take advantage of to support student success. So we have, as a department, we have a resource outside of our department at the college level that has institutional backing that can help us generate support um, at all levels. And so their training is training that's um, been given to the advisors within all of the departments and the advisor levels within that. And so that would be our most direct um, continuance of support in the college level training. Yeah, so um, for us, we have, um, we've allocated resources to basically continuing education for faculty on this topic. So on Monday, we had an amazing session, um, Racism Untaught, um, which was uh, open to all faculty and staff. Um, and, and we had, you know, not, not everyone participated. That's a challenge. Not everyone participates in, in, in any one thing that we do, but we had a good response rate right there. All of, our, all of our faculty search committees, the members on those committees go through stride training that's um, done by the university. So that's um, um, uh, to uncover implicit bias in the process of searching and to make the committee members more aware of the role of those implicit biases. Um, we, we, we actively maintain resources for faculty um, and, and they're shared. So resources such as 
um, readings and materials for course the courses that they teach that will broaden the conversation in those courses and will include more perspectives. So that's a faculty commitment to aggregating and organizing a, a, a database of resources that uh, that's available to all faculty. Um, on the, I mean, you've kind of for me, you've kind of raised two issues, Aaron. One is the the care for students, particularly um, at the early part of the the, the curriculum. Um, and, and caring, caring for their um, uh, their experience so that they can in, you know enjoy longevity and success in the field, um, and then the faculty resources and preparation. So on the student side, for us at least, we have two full time advisors. We're searching now for a third advisor. Those advisors are disciplinary specific, so it's not um, in our case that they are professional advisors. They are professional advisors, but they also are educated in design and, and, and architecture. And so they, they already have an empathetic relationship to the field. So as they're advising students, um, we require, the university requires that um, all students in their first year get an advising um, appointment each, you know, in the first two semesters, and then one a year after that, it's required. So that's an institutional commitment to an advising structure that's meant to 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 help help students maintain their goals for um, academic goals for graduation and help them maintain pace. Because our advisors have the knowledge of the education, they've gone through it themselves. Um, they're, they're, they're able to really assist students on what I call the X factor of, of navigating, uh, you know, new, new time management pressures, new um, academic pressures, um, those sorts of things. So we're investing heavily in student success. I mean, we like to say that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to build young designers here. Um, our, our, model is, our model is not an attrition model. Um, um, I, I, in my own education, I had that tragic moment, you know, look to your left, look to your right, only one of you will graduate. Um, that was on the first day of class, that super cheery moment um, to get things rolling. And we, we're really just, um, you know, not investing in that form of design education. I think the, I think the you know, the, the, the field has changed dramatically in the time when I went to school. And I think that the education process should be continually transforming as well. So trying to teach students not only the curriculum, but, but, but how to anticipate change over a long arc in, in their careers, how to navigate uncertainty, which, which as I said in my opening statement is, is what I believe education to be, right? Is the encountering of difference and uncertainty and, and how, how you cope with that and how you have strategies for taking on that amount of uncertainty. And certainly design amplifies it as I try to get at so. Um, just, just some thoughts there to, to add into the mix. Thank you. Thank you for everyone's response. I have, we're, we're really right at time and I have a couple of people who are um, interested in asking questions. So I've instructed them to put it in the chat so that maybe um, there can be some follow-up with them um, um, but we are right at time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so I hope that this conversation was very um, impactful. And I hope that um, this will lead to further conversations, especially around the issue of equity, um, which again, when I spoke yesterday in my consulting, um, people tend to be able to do diversity well, which then leads to problems of retention um, because of a lack of belonging. Um, which then also can um, give us the false impression that we're doing the work when we have not addressed the inclusion piece and the equity piece, especially. So um, I do wanna give it over to anyone from AIA who wants to have any final words before we go and be sure to uh, include your AIA number in the chat if you haven't already. Um, I'll, I'll speak, um, Linda Marziano, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for participating today. I thought the discussion was a very good one. It took a lot of notes, a lot of things that, you know, really rose to the top for me. Um, it will help inform uh, our JEDI committee for sure. And uh, I just appreciate everybody's time and the questions were great.
and uh, thank you all. And I hope that you can all participate in tomorrow's program as well. Same time, same place. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much.